February 2nd, 2022 is now in session. Let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Seeing, just checking for public participation. Okay, if you want to come up to one of the seats over here. You could. Hi, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Jim Round. I've been employed in the town. Uh, probably between contracting and employee, probably about 26 years. Right. It's been quite a while. Uh, I just want a minute. Uh, I'd like to encourage the committee uh, to reinstate the pay to those employees who stepped up to help last year's financial crisis. Uh, as you know, their pay was cut mid-year, mid-fiscal year, uh, due to budget constraints uh, during the, the days of, uh, of COVID-19. And uh, as new cars and new capital equipment is, uh, is asked for. I, uh, I hope the committee will keep in mind that there are employees who took a hit and uh, it has not been corrected since. And that, uh, that's my bit to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know we have the um, budget, the fiscal year budgets coming up, so we will take a close look. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get started. Uh, with the warrant articles, and then we'll come back to the budget guidelines for fiscal year 23. Uh, so uh, we'll start with uh, Article 6 and 7, the replenish the reserve fund, or replenish the reserve fund. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this, uh, the reserve fund um, is basically a, uh, a ways and means reserve fund for emergency use. Um, each year we, uh, we fund it out of the operating budget with 200,000, and historically we have augmented that uh, when free cash is certified in the January payment for another 100,000, so a total of 300,000. Again, it allows us to act if we need to act on an emergency basis without calling uh, a town meeting. Um, we have not used anything to date in this account, um, so this is a transfer of 100,000 from uh, free cash into this emergency fund and the subcommittee voted 2-0 to support. Thank you, and just to add, this is our typical yearly process that yes. we follow each and every fiscal year. Um, any questions from the committee? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Um, I'll start uh, with, the, I'll have to do a roll call. Uh, Brad Bond? Yes. Uh, Christopher Campbell. Yes. Michael Hardy. Yes. Roger Riggs. Yes. Ed Parsons. Yes. Doug. Yes. John. Yes. Rob. Yes. Oh my God, I'm blanking, sorry. David. David. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I guess uh, being Frank. here 15 years doesn't count. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Frank? Yes. Yes and yes. Bill, yes. yes. Thank you. Chair votes aye. It's unanimous. The next article is the transfer to water stabilization. Just me? This is you, yes. DPW? <laughs> DPW. So this is an annual uh, uh, transfer that we will be doing um, into the foreseeable future to move the um, additional water. Uh, we voted to increase the water bill uh, annually to help pay for the MWRA. And, and so this additional money goes into a, a stabilization fund. <laughs> Eventually, it has to go to the general fund, and then it gets shifted over to the stabilization fund. So um, each January, we, uh, since 2019 and, and into the foreseeable future, we will be uh, transferring from free cash to the water stabilization fund. And then in May, uh, we will uh, 
authorized to spend from the water stabilization fund to pay the bills for the MWRA connection. So this year we, we'd like to transfer $802,040.03. Thank you. Questions? Frank? Yeah, I probably should know this, but um, I assume that the way this is going to work is we're going to flow money from the general fund into free cash and then from free cash to stabilization. And so the amounts are going to run between three quarters of a billion and a million dollars, right? And we're going to do this for how many years? Yeah, well, I, I'm just curious. What it does is it, it sort of makes uh, free cash look a little funny for a while. So you have, you have to assume that there's about a million bucks in there that's just going to disappear right away. Uh, it's, yeah. a, it's just a transfer mechanism. And uh, that's something we're not. And it's going to increase right. annually. It's going to increase annually. Yes, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Denizio. Right, that's right on. Uh, the amount that this transfer has been for the last few years has just about doubled in size each each year. Uh, it's going to continue to do so for a little bit longer. Maybe not double in size. It'll peak at a, a certain time when our debt service is, is set and we're no longer buying water from the MWRA. So, and, and would the whole thing disappear at that point? So at that point, we'll either make the decision to then just build it right into the operating budget and not have to do the shift, and then every year that revenue will come in the operating budget and be paid out. But it's going to take some time to get to that point till all the increases have happened and all the debt is set and the costs are set. Okay, so we should be aware for the next few years that we've got a, a million buck float in free cash that really isn't free cash. I mean, it's free cash, but you can't use it unless you want to cause a problem. Right. Right. Thank you. Thanks, John. Mike. Mike Hardy. Uh, yep. Um, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a question on the, uh, the MWRA water. I, I think that originates from the Quabbin Reservoir. Is that where it's coming from? That's correct. Yes. correct. Yes. Okay. And, and where is it cleaned? Is it cleaned at the Quabbin and shipped out, or does it go into Boston first and then come out to the communities? It's not clean. It's, <laughs> it's pristine. It's, pristine. Or, it's, taller, John. Taller, John. it's called as, called as, as water. is water. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the, the name of the, the town's town escaping, escaping me now, but it's someplace um, um, in between, between, between Massachusetts Reservoir and Boston. Um, they have a big treatment plant uh, where most of the treatment takes place. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll get the exact town for you um, next time we come back. I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to think of my, it myself as I it's go through Room 2, yes. Yeah. But, okay. <clears throat> I thought they also had a place on the Pikes between uh, Boston, not Charlton, but um, between uh, 495 and 95. Yeah, they have a big aqueduct and it goes to this plant. Yeah. Uh, as I recall, it's, it's in between Worcester and Boston. Okay. Outside 495. Okay. One, one more question. Is there any, while we're on water, is there any update on that, that PFAS filtering system that's going into Mill Pond? Uh, yes. Project has been approved by the uh, land use boards, and uh, it's ready to go out to bid. And we're ready to start constructing the addition onto the plant and the filters, um, which we have thought that there would be a shortage of, uh, have been ordered in advance. Uh, so we're hopeful that they'll come in um, in time for the, when, when the building's complete, where we can start using them. Great, thank you. We're well on our way, though. Good. Any further questions? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Thanks, Frank. Second. Thanks, David. Um, I'll start on the call. Uh, Brad Bond. Yes. Chris Campbell. Yes. Ed Parsons. Yes. Thank you. Mike Hardy. Yes. Roger Riggs. Yes. Doug. Yes. John. Yes. Yes. David? Yes. Frank? And then Phil? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, and Chair will tie. Seniority, man. It's <laughs> <laughs> Age before beauty, yeah. Steve. You must Thank be you. Over, you're overdressed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve, for that. You look like a million bucks, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next on the, on the 
uh, Article 8, transfer to stabilization. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so uh, historically, we have had, we have looked at the transferring funds into stabilization. Over the years, we were, we were doing that when cash was certified, and we built the stabilization, stabilization fund up to about a little over $10 million. So uh, it seemed to be a, a, a good number that we, uh, that we worked off of. Um, for this uh, article, um, last uh, September, we took 150000 out of stabilization to fund the, the Macy's tax abatement. Um, so uh, we just thought it was a, a good exercise to, uh, now that free cash is certified, to replace that money back in stabilization. So it's really just replacing that uh, 150000 So Great. subcommittee voted 2-0 to support that. Great. And the subcommittee voted the same for the replenished reserve fund, just for the record, I didn't ask. OK. Any questions? John. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Didn't want you to forget me. Um, David, is there a target uh, percentage to stabilization, if what we're shooting for, you know, as a percentage of budget or something else? So the, they're, they're really, again, hasn't been. The committee has talked about it over, over, over years and what have you. And again, stabilization is what, what it says, is, is it stabilized. So we've got free cash, and free cash is certified this year at about 18 million. Uh, 10,000 or uh, 10 million also in stabilization funds. So we've kind of benchmarked that number that if, if our needs are there, you know, obviously our operating budget is going up and it's really just being used to stabilize it if needed. But, right, that's but why I'm wondering as the budget is going up, should we be thinking about increasing this or we think we're happy or? Maybe Gary, it would, again, we, we've talked about it. We, we've, we have felt as a group comfortable at, at that number for a period of time, but. It, it, David's absolutely correct. We've, uh, from year to year, we're looking to look at the stabilization, and it's really a you know rainy day fund. Uh, we needed it for the 150. We made it, uh, we made a payment of uh, interest, and uh, we we just want to replenish it, not make any addition. We usually wait to May town meeting and take a look. Do we have uh, some monies we think we can set aside? And uh, you know, it's year to year. There's no set. Percentage. Okay. But a magic number? No. Nope. Again, <laughs> that's the, the, the short good. answer, and it feels good number. But it's a good number. I mean, ten million is a. Is a good number. Thank, you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to pursue that a, a bit more. So, when we get around to the disposition of where we are with free cash, going into May Town meeting, this is always one of the things that we look at. Just as, as Gary cited, this is just a housekeeping thing because we didn't really need to use it but it was the only convenient thing to get at to fund this thing for the abatement. Um, and rather than a percentage of the operating budget, the way I look at it at least is it's really a, a risk management thing. Um, if your free cash was really low and you felt like you had risk in revenues or unforeseen circumstances were mounting like maybe a water problem or a, a you know, big piece of equipment, you might in the Maytown meeting decide to, to move the number up just for that purpose. And we could also consider, especially if free cash becomes, you know, we've been in a, um, a windfall of free cash for quite a few years. We've we really accumulated fairly well, but that, that's not going to continue forever, most likely. And so at that point, we may elect to make stabilization just a little bit stronger or make it a percentage of the operating budget, possibly. Um, th those would be my views. But right now, there's really no data that says we've got a problem or we should put more money in there. And you have to realize that when you put it in there, it's a two-thirds vote to get it out. Free cash is a lot easier to manage, actually. Yeah, free cash is half. 50% vote. Yeah. And I, if, I may, if I may, Mr. Chair, sure. to uh, add to that, uh, in the last year or two, we've had some uh, town departments and schools return some money back to the town, which built up to the free cash. I'm not sure as we go through the right. next few years that we'll be able to Can't say we have that, that much in there. Thank you. Uh, Brad. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, back in the uh, Mercer administration, we, we kind of bandied about uh, the idea that we would want 10% of the operating budget available through three channels, uh, stabilization, free cash, and uh, uh, taxing capacity. Uh, when Petron came in, he uh, 
scoffed at uh, making use of the taxing capacity and, and uh, for, for, for those reasons. So uh, um, th there's really not a there's really not a well-established best practice out there. Uh, but uh, uh, again, Frank and David have been on top of this uh, in recent years, and uh, and uh, I've learned to trust their judgment as far as uh, the stabilization number is concerned. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Brad. Thanks, thank, you, thank you, Brad. Any further questions? Okay. Chair will entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Roger Riggs. Yes. Mike Hardy. Yes. Ed Parsons. Yes. Christopher Campbell. That's the warrant. You want it? Oh. Is that a yes? Yeah. I, I didn't hear that. Okay. Uh, Brad, uh, Brad Bond? Uh, yes. Frank? Yes. Phil? Yes. David? Yes. Rob? Yes. 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 Thanks. And the chair votes aye. <clears throat> it's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, the next is the Transportation Infrastructure Fund, Article 9. So this is another fairly new but annual um, article that we have. Uh, the state collects 20%, 20 cents for every initiated ride share, so Lyft, Uber, uh, and 10 cents of each, uh, for each ride that initiates in Burlington gets, uh, we get back. Um, we're, we're requesting, uh, we, we received $12,001.10 um, for rides originally originating in Burlington in 2020 and um, this warrant article would uh, allow those funds to be used to offset the town's rideshare program the transportation program that we put in place when we eliminated the beeline wow. bus service is there a subcommittee vote no okay any questions Frank just one thank you mr. chairman who is the um, the supervising authority over this this fund. It's it's not a revolving account, right? Mr. Sagarino. Yes, it's a, it's a receipts reserve for appropriation fund. Uh, so we receive the money and then we have to ask for town meetings permission to utilize it. So is it under the auspices of the town administrator? Um, that's not that's not clear. Right. On the expenditure, as long as it falls within the uh, guidelines of the program. Uh, and it's a small enough amount of money, I'm assuming, that just using it as a strict offset just helps. I believe it over the past several years we've used it towards sidewalks. Um, ah, that was my question. What else and, is it? Uh, yeah. I believe um, we were going we to request a recommendation from the Transportation Committee just to see if they had any. <laughs> In the event that uh, there's nothing creative that comes of this, we can use it towards uh, sidewalks, which, has, as everybody knows, is a big uh, initiative. So that gets back to the supervising authority, or who, you know, who makes the decisions or gets the recommendations for what it should be used for after we move it in there. That's right. So, uh, so as Paul said before, we um, requested some feedback from the transportation committee. Uh, Mr. Sanchez will gladly take it for sidewalks for sure, um, but we. Their, their committee have just sort of just got going and didn't really have any uh, project specific that they could put it towards. So the last two years, we used about $55,000 to help offset the program, uh, the pilot program, because we just don't know what the participation is going to be yet. Um, so we did that again this year. What happens is we move it from that receipts reserve account after town meetings appropriates it, and we put it in the the Offset operating costs of the pilot of the, of the transportation program. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Chair will entertain a motion. Motion approved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Uh, Brad. Yes. Uh, Chris Campbell. Yes. Ed, Parsons. Ed Parsons. Yes. Roger Riggs. Yes. Mike Hardy. Yes. Frank. Yes. Bill. Yes. David. Yes. Rob. Yes. Yes. John. Yes. 
That's unanimous. Chair votes in favor, so that's unanimous. Uh, so now we have the repurpose the Article 25 of June 2020 Economic Development Study. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So yes, as you said, this is just repurposing money that has already been approved at town meeting. Article 25 in June 2020, which was an economic development study for 35,000. Uh, Melissa had written a pretty detailed memo for the group, so you should have all received that. Um, but soon after we had appropriated these funds, uh, Melissa was made aware of a grant program entitled Community One Stop for Growth. And she filled out the application and the town was awarded a $85,000 grant. And much of the uh, scope of that, uh, that grant money um, was covered through that, what we had appropriated the $35,000 for. Um, that report is due to be finished this coming spring, and we'll see that. Uh, the office, though, is now requesting that we repurpose those funds uh, for an increase in efforts for communication and promotion of Burlington, which is certainly something that's needed now. Um, that was to be done specifically through, you know, web and social media outlets. So they did uh, develop a new website, uh, and I want to bring that to the audience's attention, and, and you all, if, if you haven't read it yet, or if you haven't uh, opened it yet, it's bringmetoburlington.com. Um, so I, I, I suggest you, you go on it. It's, they've done a fantastic job already. Um, so uh, Frank and I, as a subcommittee, uh, voted two zero to support. Thank you. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Uh, okay. Roger? Yes. Mike Hardy? Yes. Chris Campbell? Yes. Ed Parsons? Yes. And Brad Bond? Yes. Doug? Yes. John? Yes. Frank? Yes. Bill? Yes. David? Yes. Rob? Yes. And the chair votes aye. So that's unanimous. Uh, Article 11, the Fox Hill School Feasibility Study. Roger. All right, uh, we've got some guests tonight who can go into details, but I'll give a brief uh, sort of intro. Uh, so Article 11 requests $1.5 million for a feasibility study for a new school. Uh, the need to replace Fox Hill has been, is clear and it's based on overcrowding and poor conditions of the building. Last year, Burlington was accepted into the Massachusetts School Building Authority for, for the program as we had proposed it, and we're in the middle of the uh, evaluation stage. Uh, a building committee was convened, uh, consisting of school committee members, teachers, principals, parents, uh, town accountant, and ways and means representatives. Uh, the first phase of the SBA program evaluates essentially the need as measured by enrollment figures. They take a lot of uh, information about current enrollments and past enrollments, developments in the town, uh, fertility rates, and they build out a 10-year expected enrollment plan. So they've got their spreadsheets that show what they expect the enrollment to be. Um, that's been reviewed by the building committee and school committee. And at this point, in order to proceed with the school building authority program, there are two things that Burlington has to do. One is we have to agree to the en enrollment plan. And number two, we have to authorize funding for the feasibility study. And that funding is exactly this article 11. Um, so after this extensive discussions, both the building committee and the school committee have agreed or support the idea of continuing with the MSBA program and support this article for 1.5 million for the feasibility study. The Ways and Means Subcommittee voted 400 in favor. And I should probably turn it over to either Bob or Eric for some more background and uh, detail. Thanks, Thanks Bob, Bob for, for Dr. 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 Conti. Bob, are you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so again, uh, thank you to the committee, and obviously thank you to Roger Riggs. Um, everything you said is factual and correct. Uh, I'll fill you in a little bit more. Um, so the way the MSBA process works is that uh, we submit a statement of interest 
um, which happened last year uh, in April. Um, we were notified uh, in, I'm trying to think, of July that we were accepted into phase one, which is the eligibility period. So the eligibility period looks at uh, enrollment as the number one factor as to whether or not um, the building is uh, a good candidate for MSBA funding. Um, the, this part of the eligibility does not take into consideration anything else except for enrollment. I'm going to stress that enrollment, right? So we're not looking at the plot of the land. We're not looking at how big the gym is. We're not looking at cafeteria spaces or any other teaching spaces in the building. We're just looking at K through five. Um, as part of the enrollment process, the eligibility process phase one that we're currently in, um, there are some steps that we need to take, which we have already met. We need to uh, do a maintenance plan, a capital plan. We need to submit our enrollment figures. And then the MSBA comes back with a calculation that also has their enrollment projections. Um, we need to accept their enrollment projections and then we need to have an authorized vote from town meeting. Um, and that is what's in front of you tonight. The authorized vote is a $1.5 million fund that we're asking for, which is a requirement of this eligibility phase of MSBA. That being said, what's supposed to happen is, is that we need to show MSBA, not only do we agree with their terms, which we have and we've complied with so far, but that we're also willing to fund the next phase of the project if MSBA deems us eligible to continue. So by asking for this $1.5 million, that's showing MSBA that we're committed to the project and that also shows MSBA that we are willing to fund a feasibility study, which would be an entry level, um, semi-detailed, but basically a design phase um, and then uh, a building uh, project design and then also what it would do is allow us to contract an OPM. Now, we're not looking to spend this money yet. We need to still submit this uh, approved vote to MSBA. We also need to um, accept their enrollment projections, which we have until uh, May 28th. Uh, MSBA has a board vote that happens in April, and there's another one that happens in May. We are not on any one of those schedules yet because we do not have this part of the vote. Uh, our hope tonight is that this board and obviously town meeting will support our 1.5 million request uh, so we can go back to MSBA, um, check the box with MSBA. Uh, and then if we are then at the board meeting selected to move on to the next phase, phase two, which would be a feasibility study, um, then we would obviously follow the process and seek to hire an OPM and uh, contract for a feasibility study. So hopefully, uh, if there's more questions, I'm, I'm glad to ask uh, or answer anything. I'm glad to go into any more details, but uh, specifically, again, the 1.5 million is a requirement as part of the MSBA eligibility phase one. And um, we would need town meeting to support that prior to May 20, uh, I'm sorry, March 28th. Uh, for, the, for, the audience, for the audience, can you define, you define OPM, the acronym OPM? Yes, I'm sorry. OPM is owner's project manager. So that is somebody that would assist us throughout the entire project, not just the feasibility. Um, so we would go out to bid, uh, find somebody who meets our credentials, which we would put the bid specs together. Uh, and then once we bring on an owner's project manager, uh, they would help us look and design what we think would be a, um, a building that would fit Burlington's needs. And that's what the feasibility study would do is look at the needs of Burlington, the needs that the MSBA is willing to commit to and help us design a building that would fit that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Brad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm kind of asking this question on behalf of a, uh, a former uh, two-time chair of this committee. Um, could you explain again the need for doing this in January versus May? It sounds like it's kind of a, it, it's perhaps a bit of a long shot to, to uh, get on the, uh, the spring schedule as it is. Uh, what, what are the ramifications of leaving this until May? Uh, again, through the, through the chair. Um, so, um, the ramifications would basically be it prolongs the project. Uh, so the MSBA project is a fully scripted um, six to seven year project as it is. 
Um, so when we were brought in on June 1st of 2021 into the eligibility phase, um, there's 270 days and that period ends in February 26th. Um, town meeting has been uh, delayed. So we asked for an extension to get us to the May 28th. They gave us a 30 day extension um, for that. Uh, without town meetings approval now, um, we are not eligible to get onto the uh, April or May, which are the next two board meetings. Um, so delaying this any further obviously delays the time in between. Uh, and then if we are able to get the support from town meeting and get the vote authorization for this uh, $1.5 million later, then we have to go back to town meeting. Um, the thing is, is that we've already extended our window. So at some point, the MSBA could say to us, um, we already given you an extension. Sorry, you're not interested or you're not meeting our needs. So they were eligible. We were eligible for one 30 day window, which they've granted us now. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, and, and again, just uh, for the sake of uh, viewers and perhaps some of our newer members, uh, yeah, we try and uh, uh, hold off on expenditures and especially uh, sizable expenditures until May when we can kind of get the big picture on uh, all the moving parts. But uh, but yeah, Bob, I, I'm I, I'm sold on this and I, I will support this. Uh, Roger, Bob Roger, is this is this free, free cash, 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 correct? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mike Hardy. Mike Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Bob, if if our project isn't selected or approved by MSBA, what happens to the, the money we're uh, spending on this? Uh, uh, so through the chair again, great question. Um, there is a provision that obviously um, we still need to be selected by MSBA to move forward with MSBA grant funds, right? Um, but if we were to select an OPM and decide to go forward without MSBA's funding, um, we are eligible to use this based on the wording that MSBA provided in this contract. Um, but again, we still need town meeting to support us with that. So hopefully I'm explaining this correctly that you can all understand. The money is sitting obviously in a fund and if we get selected by MSBA to move forward with it, we will use that money to fund our OPM. If we are not selected by MSBA to move forward and they don't deem us eligible, um, we have to have a bigger conversation because there's no point of us moving forward with an OPM and a design fee um, if we don't have town meeting support or the town support uh, and building a school funding it solely without MSBA's money. So uh, it's twofold, meaning that our intent is obviously to be eligible for the MSBA, um, but if not, we have to have future conversations with the, the town anyways, regardless, even if we are selected by MSBA we still have to come back to the town and ask um, to support the full project cost. Okay, thanks. 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 Uh, Phil. Phil. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I'm not in favor, favor of this for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first, from, first, from a money standpoint, a priority standpoint, I think PFAS for 15 million and uh, the police station should be ahead of this. The, uh, you know, equity is a popular word these days, and I think it's inequitable to expect the cops to wait another 10 years and be working in, <coughs> excuse me, a mold infested, leak infested, and structurally damaged building uh, for, for 10 years going forward. Uh, secondly, I, I'm not sure where the MSBA is on this in terms of knocking the Fox Hill down. I'm not in favor of knocking any of the elementary schools down. I think. Uh, uh, knocking them uh, uh, while we're down was a, uh, was a major blunder. Uh, we've, had we've had good luck in rehabbing, rehabbing buildings. buildings. We've rehabbed the, uh, the, Senate, the Senate School, school which is 50 years or 40 years uh, older, than older than these buildings and is still a functional building. building. We rehab we the Meadowbrook, which, which is still an operational building. building. Uh, the, Francis uh, the Francis Wyman, Wyman and the Marshall Simons have all been rehabbed. rehabbed. Uh, so, so I think, I think that, that money, money would be well spent if we rehabbed both, both the Fox Hill uh, uh, and the uh, Pine, Glen, Pine Glen, as opposed to knocking them down or following whatever MSBA or recommendation there is. Uh, I don't favor transporting little kids all over town, particularly to a bigger building if that's what their plan is for uh, Fox Hill and, uh, 
and Pine Glen. And lastly, and lastly uh, uh, I would just say these number of these, number of these have, to have to be pushed back, back uh, in terms, in terms of, of the bonded indebtedness. indebtedness. Right now, right now, if we look at, at uh, the money, that, money that, we're that we're talking about, we already, we already have eighty million dollars in bonded debt. debt. I think we have six million in bond anticipation notes. Is that correct, Gary? Six point five. Eighty million in outstanding debt. And if you, and if you add these projects, projects, the Fox Hill, the PFAS, uh, the uh, the, uh, uh, the labs, we know the high school is going to be at least forty million. If we talk about the boilers and the HVAC system, maybe not forty, maybe thirty, give or take whatever number of millions. Uh, so we're talking in a relatively short period of time of. Increasing, increasing our bond and indebtedness up to $180 million just doesn't, just doesn't make any sense to me. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Install. Any other questions? Questions, comments, comments? John? Uh, thank, you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, um, yeah, I had, yeah, I had, had a few questions on this. Uh, uh, the first one has to do with the 1.5 million. When I looked at the backup, it looks like the typical feasibility studies are uh, about 1.72% for the feasibility study. So this would imply that you're, you're looking at a, a cost of, a project cost of about 87 million, which seems a lot higher than what's shown in the backup. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, what is the expected project cost and what, um, you know, how do you arrive at the 1.5 million? Through the chair. So, uh, let me start first with how do we arrive at the $1.5 million? Um, myself, Ms. Kasha, and um, a town employee, we met with MSBA, and we looked at MSBA's figures of what they had uh, previously projected for OPMs and feasibility studies, and we presented the number. Like I stressed already, the MSBA project is really, really scripted. They don't want you to veer left or right. They want you to follow their process to a T. Um, where you get some leeway is when you get into the design phase, which we're not in yet. That being said, um, looking at the numbers, which I provided in the backup, um, we started with 1 million, which MSBA was not comfortable with. Uh, we went to 1.2, uh, MSBA was not comfortable with, and 1.5, MSBA was comfortable with. Um, given the market right now, uh, given the fact that we would have to go to bid for an OPM and go to bid for a feasibility study, um, you know, again, we're looking at least another six months, if not more, out from now. So uh, I guess undercutting was definitely something that they did not want to do. And they wanted to make sure, like I said, that we were committed to the project. So obviously, whatever money's not being spent um, in the initial phases, because a, a feasibility study could be less than the $1.5 million. Uh, an owner's project manager could be less than $1.5 million. Uh, but that money is available to the full cost of the project throughout the time. So the OPM we're gonna have on board potentially for six to seven years. And even after the feasibility study, the language in the MSBA contract allows that money to be used further into. So as far as the cost of the building, um, we can't tell you that right now. Uh, we can tell you what other projects have cost, but we don't have a building design in front of us, right? So if we're looking at, let's say potentially a you know 400 student building, they can say by square inch what the going rates are right now. I think it's a little bit high, but MSBA is quoting approximately $600 a square foot. Now we've definitely seen less than that. And if you look at MSBA's projections, uh, the last couple of years show less than 600 per square foot. Um, so again, anywhere from three to 600 is probably realistic. So we could be looking for a $30 million building, $50 million building, I'm not sure. What I will say is that once the feasibility study is complete, if we get to that point in the project, um, we need to come back to not only school committee, but we need to come back to town meeting. We need to ask for the full funding of the project. So if we are coming in asking for a $50 million project, um, then that's depending on whatever size of the building that was calculated. And then depending on MSBA's funding uh, is determined by how much we're eligible for in return back. But we would still need town meeting to fund the full cost of the building that we don't have yet. Um, okay, okay, I understand. It sounds like MSBA sort of forced our hand on the 1.5. I, I guess I was suggesting going town meeting, it would be really beneficial to have 
cost, a cost estimate, estimate that, that you think, you think is reasonable. I understand it's just an estimate, but I think saying we don't know is a, a bad way to go into starting a project. I, I think you need to have a number that you're saying this is a likely outcome at least. Um, that'd be my recommendation to help sell it. Uh, the the um, so, so what, um, what um, I, guess I guess my second, second question is just uh, as, as the articles worded, worded it, money the money spent, spent under the authority of the, the school building, building committee, um, I, I, guess I, I guess I'm a little, little uncomfortable with it being, being under the authority of a committee that hasn't been elected and I'm not entirely sure how it was formed. I assume that the school committee essentially put that together. But uh, I'm wondering, is this typical that this size, this amount of money would be under a school, a school building, building sub ad hoc subcommittee, subcommittee, or would it be more appropriate to have this be under the authority of the school committee? Obviously, obviously they could have recommendations from the, the building committee, but it strikes, it strikes me as odd. It, 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 Mr. Dizzy, I don't know if Bob wanted me to help out, but the, uh, as Bob had mentioned earlier, the uh, the process through the MSBA is very restricted, and this is the process that they use. The warrant, the article comes straight from them. It's approved by the council also, uh, but the way it works is they just approve the bills. The bills still get processed the same way as all those bills, but that committee, and it's the same in, in, uh, for every MSBA project, that committee, because of the intimate knowledge of the project, approves the bills as they come in. Does the, Does the school committee have some authority over that to the extent that they don't uh, agree with perhaps what's being approved or for paying a bill? Yeah, or or allowing a, a, a liability to be you know created, like signing contracts and so on. Yeah, so so the the way the contracts is work like all contracts. Uh, the, the, town the town administrator is the only person that can bind the, con the town to a contract. So they, would so they would still go through the regular process as all of our rest of our contracts. It would just, it would just be initiated by the school building committee that would then interview the architect or the OPM, come up with a contract. Uh, you know, there's a bid process that's used. But as far as binding the town to the money, it would go through the same process as every other contract. Okay, okay. It, it, it just, that, makes that makes me feel a lot better. So, so, they, so they, can't they can't create a liability for a town. They can only say it looks like this was done, we approve paying it. Okay, and presumably the administrator would look to the school committee for guidance on significant contracts. Maybe. <laughs> Uh, so one other thing while I was up here, I, Steve, I said you had to add too. Um, this article isn't free cash. Uh, it may sound like that doesn't make much sense, but the, the reason you do it like that is because when you do have the final project, if, if we do get to that stage, the actual article and the motion language is all inclusive and includes this piece of the project too. Uh, so we'll do them as two separate projects, but when we do, if we do get to the time of a final approval, they're lumped together for MSBA because it's all part of the same project. So that's, so that's why you do it as a borrowing. Uh, we may choose to then pay for it with free cash at a, at a later time, but you originally approve it as a borrowing. So I just wanted to clear that up. This motion is for borrowing? It will be, yeah, the final motion, that'll be so it. It, but the, but It's on the warrant right now. The, the actual motion is a little right. bit different. So that would, that would end up at a, a bond anticipation note or something like that? Right. So that means it has a higher, a higher, higher two-thirds two uh, town meeting floor. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate your patience. Uh, there's uh, <clears throat> so there's two articles actually on the warrant right now. One assuming MSBA and one assuming not MSBA. If I read it properly, uh, but the so I'm unclear, so I'm unclear are both of those. Articles uh, plan to be be brought forward, uh, and if so, what's the amount attached to the non-MSBA one? And then finally, if you know we're serving a situation we obviously don't want both of them spent, <laughs> but the wording doesn't say you only get half half one or the other. Uh, so I'm wondering how's that all work? Steve, the chair. Yep. Yep. Go ahead, go ahead, Roger. Well, we'll switch on. Okay. Yeah, I should have mentioned earlier, both the building committee and the school committee agreed that uh, Article 12 should be withdrawn. Okay. Uh, okay. 
that, that makes that a lot easier. Thank you. Yeah, there was uh, there was a discussion about whether the language in Article 11 could apply to all of the contingencies that we had in mind, and the conclusion was that it could be used um, and avoid the confusion of two articles. So, Article 11 is the only one on the on the that will be uh, on the warrant. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and then the final question is, uh, can someone define exactly what the deliverable of a feasibility study is? You know, what, I'm hoping we get more than a million dollar, you know, 10 page report out of this. <laughs> Mr. Um, I think from my previous answer, you won't like this one, but um, we're not at that phase yet. So what I can use is from previous ones. Um, we've been told by MSBA that some of the process has changed since 2008 when we did the middle school. Um, that being said, um, yes, I definitely agree for $1.5 million, which we are not looking to spend fully on the feasibility study. We also need to hire an OPM as well. Um, we would expect more than a 10 page document. Uh, but like I said, uh, since that is a scripted project, we don't have that in front of us yet. Um, so I can't give you the full definition terms of what that deliverable exactly looks like. Uh, you're, you're right. I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm thinking at it, and I understand where you're coming from. I, 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 again, I think you know for town meeting, I, I think a, something would be really beneficial would be if you could include a point or two of another project's feasibility study, so we get a sense of you know here's what you get out of this process. Uh, there's a lot of things I'm imagining it could be, but you know, obviously, obviously that, that's, that's, not, that's not good enough to spend one and a half million dollars. <laughs> it, it, are, there are there examples of past feasibility, past feasibility studies where we could say this is, this is the kind of thing we, we would expect to get out of this? Uh, yes, I could definitely do that. Okay, okay. I, I think that would be worth a lot to, to uh, make it clear what we're spending the money on. Understood. Yeah, thank, yeah, you, thank you, Mr. Thank you, John. Any further? Any further? Yeah, I, yeah I, I was just, was wondering, just wondering what it would cost, Bob, uh, for us to do an RFQ on our own for a rehab of the Fox Hill. Wouldn't cost a million and a half bucks, right? Uh, for, for just the feasibility study? No, just the rehab on our own. Like it's our building and we want to rehabilitate it and we want to request for qu uh, quotation from a, from a construction company. So the overall project, I believe, would cost a lot more than $1.5 million. The feasibility study to do that, I believe, would be less than $1.5 million to find out what it would cost us. I'm not talking about a feasibility study. If you just said, I want to rehabilitate the windows, the HVAC, the floors, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. what would that cost you to do that? Um, we have estimates from 2017 uh, when we did a, a full master plan of all of our buildings. Um, that puts us over 20 million. 20 million to rehab it. To rehab it, yes. But that, I know, would that address the space issue? Well, uh, you know, no, that doesn't change the layout of the building. That doesn't change the configuration of the classrooms. I mean, that's talking about what you said, replacing the roofs, redoing floors, redoing boilers, right. air conditioning, HVAC systems, um, you know, uh, lower cost lighting things like that, like a full rehab that way. Um, yeah, so we have that, like I said, from 2017. And what is the likelihood that this feasibility study is gonna come back and recommend the Fox Hill be destroyed and the Pine Glen abandoned? In favor uh, of a much larger building on that site? I think that's an option that we as a school building committee and a school committee have to decide because I think MSBA mm -hmm. is willing to look at it and say, you have multiple options. Um, one would be building a building X size that supports the number of students, and one would be building a building that's larger uh, that could possibly condense uh, Pine Glen into a Fox Hill. But we don't have that in front of us right now. We just have, again, projections of where MSBA would lead us. So the feasibility would study would turn around and say, well, I'm projecting, here is what a building would cost and look like that would support um, consolidating Pine Glen into Fox Hill. Here is what a building would cost and look like just replacing Fox Hill. Did the abandonment of the Wildwood come out as a recommendation of the SBA? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. 
Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I have some numbers that I think uh, Mr. Eiler will like. Uh, I'm not sure the school administration will because they've been hesitant to pin down numbers. Um, but in the context of the school building committee, I uh, did a regression analysis on all school building projects in in Massachusetts since 2014 and came up with an expected value for a school or expected numbers, cost numbers for a school of the size we're contemplating. Uh, and that would be about $41 million total. The total for the owner's project manager billings is um, about $1.7 million. And the total costs for feasibility studies is about $700,000. That's over the entire seven year project lifespan. So I think that we would get uh, more of a verdict on the feasibility for um, a good deal less than the $700,000 spend. Um, I think the, the $1.5 million price tag is just to establish a commitment um, that would allow us to uh, take bids for uh, the owner's project uh, manager and and get serious bids and convince the MSBA that we're serious to move forward. And that's the purpose for the, the authorization. And I'll let the uh, Bob or, or Eric comment further. Bob or Eric? Um, Ed, I think you did a pretty good job. Thank you on that. Um, I don't want to say, can you repeat the question, but what else would you like me to add to that? <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm being clear with your so, answer. So I, <laughs> because you've been hesitant to give numbers and I understand okay. you don't want to pin down something that becomes a promise, so a promise. but, um, but the question I, I believe from Mr. Eiler was, you know, what, what are the likely numbers, um, which would help the town meeting to contextualize what we're signing up for. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm just looking at my notes for a quick second and I will give you a rough answer on that. So uh, again, I think Ed, you, you came back with approximately $40,000. Again, this is for the total project minus uh, not including any reimbursement at all from MSBA. 40 million, right. For 40 the million. Um, based on MSBA's numbers of 600,000, um, I'm sorry, $600 per square foot finished complete um, memorial would cost us approximately $48 million. Again, prior to any reimbursements. That's just based on the square footage of approximately 82,000 square feet. If we were to build a building um, 100,000 square feet, um, you'd be looking at 60 million. If we were to build a building that is um, Again, let's go Fox Hill right now is 62,000 square feet. So if we go 62,000 times the MSBA's quoted number of 600, uh, that puts us at 38 million. So now those are high numbers, sure. Obviously we can scale those down by going to 500 to square foot, 400 to square foot. Um, but like I said, we need to see obviously where the bids come back at and we're probably potentially two and a half to three years away um, from digging into the ground. So I think knowing what those numbers are today versus what they're going to be in a year or two, uh, I don't see them going down. I see them potentially going up the longer the project takes. Um, but I would say a conservative number before MSBA reimbursement would definitely be 40 to $50 million. Right now, we are sitting at approximately 44% of MSBA reimbursement, approximately. And again, that would be most things are eligible. So when I say approximate, same during the feasibility study, we need to see uh, if we build anything outside of MSBA scope that is not eligible. That would mean we would be on the hook for the full total of that if we follow their script completely then we would get reimbursement at the 44% rate that MSBA approves. Thanks. 
Any further questions? No. So this is a, a little bigger and it's a little follow up on, on Phil's concerns. Do we as a town, I know as a town, we have a 10 year capital budget plan where we talk about replacing dump trucks and, and, and large capital, capital equipment. That we own. But uh, what do we have on a schedule for buildings? Anything? I mean, I, I, you know, I know we need to replace Fox Hill and now Pine Glen's an issue and we're still worried about the high school and those are all bunching up against each other and Phil's absolutely right. Our, our police station is, is embarrassing. Um, and, and so it feels like these things are all kind of bunching up and building up and, and I, we're gonna have to address them all. We just have to figure out the order and the way in which we do it. And I feel like we need a guidance. See, the, the start with Frank. Frank. Yeah. They, I, I'm almost certain what they're going to try to do or will do here. You have to remember that um, every year, Town Hall 1 does sort of a semi-decent job on looking at the bond, and bonded and debt in a schedule and the rollout, including what burdens are projected further out in the plan. So we look at the money for this year, and that's your principal and interest, and we, we have a policy about what we'd like to see that number be no greater than. And then we look at what's already stacked up in, in the schedule and try to look at leveling. And they, they do this in these giant spreadsheets that, that nobody can read, but they hand out every year. And so, so the critical question, it's, it's to Phil's point, to your point, what we really need to be fairly clear on is for the projects that we know about, whether they occur five years from now or even as much as 10 years from now, we do have a list of the ones we know we gotta get to, right? We gotta get to one or two elementary schools. We gotta get to the high school. We gotta get to the police station. We gotta get to water treatment. And there's probably, yeah, and that's, and that's partially offset. So what I wanna know, I think what everybody would like to know here and you're about to tell us is, for the plan that we have now, for the bond plan, including the things we know and the things we got a good guess at, where do we stand in the rollout? And I would look at it as a percent of the operating budget. The guideline would worked by is to try to keep that, you know, in the 6% range. In other words, your principal and interest every year, if that's 6% or, or lower of your total operating budget, you're probably in a, that's a, a pretty good policy position. And that's how I've always looked at it in Town Hall 1. And I think we're, we, that's, we're, we're at or below that level right along, including all these things. That's what I'd like to hear about again. Paul or John. Sure. Thanks. Um, so I agree with Frank that we do a, a pretty detailed look at this every year when we vote the debt number. And what we try to do is smooth out our increases over a period of time. You've probably heard me say that a few times, the smoothing effect. Um, and that's because if we were to fund everything on our debt plan for the next 10 years, we'd need to raise our appropriation a million dollars a year every year for 10 years. Uh, and then we would go from uh, about 5% of our operating budget for debt service to well into the teens, almost 20%. Um, so luckily, uh, through the years, we've had everything on our debt plan, and as we've used the free cash to do some things and, and stuff has moved further out, we've been able to, to maintain that plan pretty well. Um, and that, that's been going on for a long time, and we hope it goes on into the future. Uh, so these things, so that answers the first question about that, Frank, I think. But uh, the original question was what's on the plan for these, for school projects, for the, for the uh, police station. Uh, so a few years back when, when it looked like the high school wasn't going to be the, the priority anymore because it had been turned down seven or eight times in a row and it shifted to the Fox Hill, we shifted the plan a little bit. Uh, and then changed the dollar values and sort of assumed we would borrow a little bit of money uh, for the for the next school project uh, for about 27 uh, million dollars of, of our uh, cost and assume that was going to cover a 45 million dollar project whether that was at the high school or at Fox Hill uh, we assumed we were going to have to do a piece of the high school project uh, on our own without any MSBA support or participation because we had been turned down so many times in a row and uh, assuming we were going to have to do the HVAC portion on our own. So we had another $13 <coughs> million in for that. Uh, and then we had another $40 million in for the rest of the high school project or uh, two elementary schools or whatever that 
whatever that was further down the road, but they're all spaced out pretty good. And in there, there's the police station um, and there's uh, the MSBA connection and things like that. And now there's PFAS also in there. And so. in, in the plan spaced out and then the timing looks good enough for what you can tell. And that keeps us at what percent of our operating budget? Well, that would go, it would grow pretty, pretty quickly to uh, from about 5% now, if, if we funded the plan as it, as the last iteration was, um, we would grow by about a million dollars a year for that uh, appropriation. We would go well into, beyond what we're comfortable with, percent of the operating budget. We'd go from about uh, $6 million now, or almost $7 million now, to $17 million in 10 years, and uh, that percentage would go through the roof. So we always talk about when we look at the debt plan, we say this is sort of accounting for everything and setting it up right. But if we have to do this as it's laid out, <laughs> we're gonna have a problem. Yeah. Uh, it just just to reiterate, those is, the schedule is built very conservatively with reasonable interest rates. We typically do better. Uh, that saves capacity in the schedule. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we uh, reallocate some borrowing to free cash and take it right off the schedule. We've done that uh, multiple times over the years. Um, and you know, we push projects out to smooth out the impact. The thing I fear most about borrowing too much money is we're going to do guidelines later. Um, we don't typically have a million dollar increase in debt, so you have to consider that in terms of operating budgets. If our accommodated our fixed costs are going up a million dollars a year, there's a lot less money to go around for operating budgets, and if the town were to decide to, to take on too much debt too soon, we're going to be having some very uncomfortable guideline conversations in terms of you know, are people willing to live with 1%, 2% operating budget increases to accommodate that debt? Because as we try to grow the debt, we try to grow it um, within the scope of the actual growth of the budget. And um, we try to smooth out the impact over a period of years. So debt isn't a budget buster to us as we're setting guidelines. Um, but if, if we were to commit to the plan, and again, it's a, it's a planning document. It's not set in, set in stone, but you know, a million dollar a year increase um, for the next 10 years, um, it's gonna wipe out the operating budget in no time. And, you know, everybody just has to be aware of what that impact will be. And that's how I, I see the biggest problems with, um, you know, the potential extra debt, the PFAS, and, 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 you know, potentially having to, you know, foot the cost of a full uh, Fox Hill on our own. It, it really does have a drastic impact and what the impact is on operating budgets. So people need to know the relationship between those two items. Thanks. I saw Brad first and then I'll yeah, go sure. to Bill. Brad? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, to the administration, uh, guys, at, at one time, the bond rating uh, agencies were, were on us for not spending, for not reinvesting enough in the town. And I believe at the time we were, what, under 4% or so of operating budget. Uh, at the time of that ding, I think they were recommending us kind of the sweet spot they like six to eight percent is that uh still the current recommendation from them uh yes <laughs> okay and uh and as i recall and in, in days gone by there there's there's always a bind in the uh, debt schedule about five years out uh are are there are there ways to it so so uh, a plus plus a million a year is pretty dire uh are there ways to smooth that or are mechanisms for smoothing that going away with the prospect of interest rates going up? Well, I, I, Brad, I think a lot of it depends upon the, the timing of the projects. Um, you know, we're gonna have to, to lay them out in a methodical way just to sort of, so that we're able to keep the debt rising smoothly. I mean, it's great to be at six to 8%, but that doesn't mean that we can just add $3 million to debt. Uh, over the course of a short period of time uh, to get there because sure. of the impact it has on everything else. But um, again, we consider the schedule to be fully conservative at this point. We haven't tried to make any accommodations uh, based upon uh, what's going on at this point in time. Uh, but certainly as the information becomes clearer uh, in terms of, of the Fox Hill and, you know, PFAS, where, you know, we're, we're going to be applying for a lot of um, funding opportunities that may be available uh, through the federal and state government to, to solve PFAS. So, I mean, if we can knock that off the schedule in, in some way, shape or form. So there's a lot of variables and a lot of moving parts, but again, the numbers that John talked about were 
um, if we just proceeded according to what the plan says now without making any adjustments along the way. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks, Brad. Phil? Did I understand correctly that our current debt service oh, principal interest is seven million a year right now? Just under seven million. Six. And if we did all of these projects over the next 10 years, it would go up to $17 million? Roughly. Okay, and what would be the total overall uh, indebtedness if we did complete those projects in 10 years? Might take me a minute to pull that up. But yeah, that, sure. And then secondly, could you give us like a top seven or eight prioritized projects? I can start with that, Phil, if you don't mind. Sure, thank you. So every couple of years, uh, we every other year we do $3 million worth of paving. In the opposite year, we do a million and a half worth of water mains. Uh, in terms of facilities, we accept the priorities from the school department in terms of what their priorities are. So we move them in, in that uh, manner. So we have the high school project on there, the Fox Hill project on there up front. Uh, we would see the police station coming somewhere in between those two. Uh, we do understand that, you know, the high school, maybe uh, boilers uh, maybe need to be replaced in advance of, uh, you know, renovating the school. So we do have some funds set aside for that emergency if it were to occur. Uh, but at the same time, if you would ask me in my mind what, how the next three would roll out, it would be whatever the school prioritizes first, whether it's the Fox Hill High School, uh, followed by the police station, and then followed by the other school project. Thank you. Uh, do you have a total, John? Uh, I don't. I'm going to have to get it back. Get back to you on that. Roughly, 170 million. Yeah, more, a little more. More. Well, and what are you using for for a uh, interest, rate. Uh, interest rate? Thank you, Frank. Effective interest rate <clears throat> over the course of the plan. I think for future plans, we use. Uh, four for 20 and under and four and a half. And you factored in Chairman Powell's comments of re recent date? We actually had a, a call yesterday. Right. Right, Gary, you can we had a uh, call yesterday The uh, from as far as interest rates, they've already started to creep back up. In a matter of three weeks, uh, the bonds, we were, we were looking at refinancing re, uh, some of our existing bonds for savings. That savings was, has dropped from a million point six to 800,000 just because of the increase in the rates. Uh, we had a further discussion talking when the Fed does make an increase and they're talking about four, four if not more uh, increases year. this year, uh, will that how will that affect the bond rating? They felt that the largest increase has already taken place, but there will be other increases as we go along. John's going to be busy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Phil. Any further questions? Hey. Yes, Roger. Um, I just want to make a point that in the in support of this particular article, um, in terms of the bond schedule and being able to plan, we need to know what the projects are going to cost. Um, maybe a, a range, as, as was discussed earlier, is good enough, but I don't have any idea what a police station costs. Um, and so I think we need we do need to do in order to figure out what the the school needs are and what it's going to cost to build a school. I think we do have to proceed with the feasibility study. And so we do need town meeting to support, you know, this next step. Um, Fox Hill is not just old, it's also too small and laid out poorly. So a renovation is actually not gonna solve the problems. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Seeing no further questions, the chair will entertain a motion. Motion oh, over. Uh, okay, I have a... I'll second that. Second, <laughs> great, thank you. Mike Hardy. But those two have already been renovated once. Did you... Uh, we're voting. There was a motion and a second. Okay, did you call me? I did, yes. Okay, uh, Brad is first. Yes. Brad Bond. Uh, yes. Um, Chris Campbell. Yes. Ed Parsons. Yes. Roger Riggs. Yes. Frank Monaco. Yes. Phil Gallagher. No. David Tate. Yes. Uh, Rob Feld, Newfield. Yes. Uh, John Eiler. Yes. Doug Davidson. Yes. And the chair votes aye. 
Thank it's you 11, very much. It's 11 to 1. Thank you. If I counted correctly. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Thanks Senator. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. So now we move on to the uh, budget guidelines. I'll turn it over to the town accountant, John Denisio. Thank you. So um, we had some slides that we shared, and I'm, I'm not sure if you want me to go through them. If so, I could share my screen so it will, uh, the folks at home would be able to see it too. Yes. I'd make you a presenter if I can figure it out. Always good. Oh, you got it. Perfect. Is that Did somebody uh, am I talking over you? No, it's just the, the microphones are still on. Oh. Yeah, I think they're hot all the time. I can't. That's the question. That's all right. I'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to John. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, what we thought we would do is just kind of review the slides that we reviewed at the budget summit. Some of the folks here were able to, to make it to the budget summit. We have some representatives from Ways and Means. Uh, town administration, select board, and school committee, school committee members. members, and we kind of go, go over, you know, administration's recommendation, and we talk about what effect that will have on everybody, and then we try to leave that meeting with uh, a recommendation to, to come here to you, uh, get that blessed so we can move forward with building the budget for next year. So I'll just, I'll go through the slides pretty quickly. You're used to seeing them every year. Um, so we had the, the initial budget summit on January 19th. Uh, we start with, we just kind of go over the process of, of how long the, the budget process is. It's a year long process. And we kind of put a, a, a cherry on top of last year, what happened and what last year's approvals through all the town meetings and into the fall town meeting, what that translated to for our tax rate. Uh, you can see what the, the rates are there for residential uh, for commercial industrial what the average single family home was um, what that and what that uh, translated to into the average uh, increase so we talked a little bit the last few years especially about property tax uh, uh, i mean property values um, everybody knows that the residential values are very strong in, in burlington it remains a desirable place to to live uh, you can tell by the home prices and that that's continued right straight through COVID. We had a lot of talk about, we were worried about what was going to happen with commercial values. Uh, we had some doomsday scenarios that we, we talked a lot about. Uh, luckily so far, none of those have come true. The values are remaining strong as a whole. That, that group did go up small, uh, a small amount, but it did go up. It wasn't uh, a decrease. There was, you know, some of the segments were affected differently, but but there's still uh, strong sales in Burlington and strong investment in Burlington. Um, we always talk about our sort of our financial indicators where we, where we started this year with free cash stabilization and excess levy capacity. I know everybody here knows what that is, but for the people at home, that's the untaxed amount. That's, that's the amount that we could have um, taxed when we set our operating budget onto the levy, but we didn't. Um, so those are those are key figures when we talk to the rating agencies about the financial health of the town. When we talk about building our budgets, we have pretty uh, we have uh, four main pillars that we use. It's to maintain a level of services where possible, uh, prioritize investment in infrastructure, minimize fees where we can, and adjust and plan for our long-term liabilities like our uh, pension and OPEB. Um, if anybody wants me to stop, just let me know about it. I'm, I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. But um, we get into revenues. We talk about the three main revenues for us, uh, local receipts, uh, which we've talked a lot about over the last few years. Uh, in fact, we, we, we decreased it by $2 million just a year and a half ago. Um, we, we, um, we, we've seen some encouraging numbers there. We'll get into that in the next slides. Uh, state aid for us isn't a huge number, uh, but it's, um, you know, one of the main contributors to our revenue and then the rest is the tax levy which is you know borne by the, the residents and the businesses in town local receipts just a little bit um, we level funded them this year uh, going into FY 22 um, 
We increased them by 500,000 in September because we did some revenue replacement from the opera funds on a three year plan for that. Uh, the data for our, our, our meals and permit is, is great. It's, uh, you know, it's outpacing projections. Uh, hotels still, still are uh, way down, you know, about 65% of what they used to be. Uh, so hopefully we'll get some encouraging news there too. But we're projecting a, a modest increase for, for FY23, which is great news. We thought we would be flat for quite some time. Uh, and now we think we'd be able to creep that up a little bit. State aid for us, again, is about $10 million. It was held harmless through the pandemic and even leading up to the pandemic. Uh, they were able to hold harmless during the pandemic, mostly due to federal revenues, backfilling uh, state funds, and you know the state also outperformed their revenue estimates too. Uh, the governor's budget at the time of these slides was coming up the following week. It's, it's come out uh, now. Uh, the governor's budget is typically the high water mark for state aid. Um, the adjustments from there usually come down a little bit. Um, there's, there's usually uh, what saves everybody is there's usually minimum aid increases, which there are again this year. Um, that makes sure people are going to grow at least by a certain amount, $25, $30 per student uh, of their foundation enrollment. <coughs> so we're estimating normal growth in FY23 for state aid. Now, given the governor's budget that was released, that could change um, based on some numbers that came through there but we'll have to get some more info on that uh, as we progress through this process. For now, we're, we're assuming the regular increase that we've been getting over the last uh, three, five, and 10 year average of a couple percent. Uh, the tax levy, we're projecting, uh, with, now that we're projecting increases in the other categories, which we didn't last year, and in fact had a decrease the year before that, not all of the increase will be borne by the, uh, by the residents of the commercial tax levy. Um, so we're, we project, we, we aim, uh, so last year we had an increase of 4.83%, that which resulted in a $264 increase to the average family tax bill. Um, we aim, our target when we're first building the budget is to, to come in between 4 and 5%. Uh, when we get to the end, you'll see that we're, we're in that range. Uh, the assumptions we use is to, uh, to have some, you know, we talked about a modest increase in the revenues. Um, as far as expenses go, we, we, we try to project um, uh, re some realistic uh, accommodated accounts. These are the fixed or undistributed accounts like health insurance, debt service that aren't attributed to each department's budget. I know everybody here knows that, but uh, for those at home, we try to uh, set a uh, operating budget of 3.5% of and to, uh, to try to control the tax levy increase. So. Given the uncertainty going into next year, all of the townside labor contracts expire at the end of this year. Uh, on the school side, their teacher contract has already expired coming into this year. Um, so given the uncertainty with that, um, along with the inflation for just buying stuff, uh, the, rec the recommendation of the administration coming in um, was to, to set a recommend, um, an operating increase of 3.5% for the school in town. Uh, we project accommodated accounts if everything goes to according to plan will come in around 5.75 that's a, a pretty good number if we can hit that and that would translate to about a 4.71 percent increase in the in the levy so it's in the range we want uh, or where we're aiming at to start um, the after discussions with that at the budget summit with that group um, uh, the case was made to to have the operating budget Increase be 3.75 for the school and 3.5 for the town. Uh, kept keeping economy accommodated about uh, what we had planned, and that puts estimates the levy increase to be about what it is this year was this year for 4.82 uh, percent. So I know I went pretty fast. So we're uh, I don't know if Paul and Gary have anything to add before we open it up to questions. Uh, the only thing I would add, uh, Mr. Chairman, is the select board supported these guidelines 5-0 at our last meeting. Thank you. Nice job, Paul. Questions? Mike. Mr. Chair, the, so let me see, the, the last slide where you, you showed those numbers, um, it would be nice to have sort of a, 
be able to place that in context of previous years. And I'm, I'm trying to recall, you know, the last few years, if we were right around that same amount or, you know, what's, what's the trend on that? Mike, I could say for the, at least the past three years, we've been in a similar range. Um, as you go back in time, um, I think you'll see the town was a little bit more conservative years ago. We had different chairs of ways and means, uh, a couple of them in the virtual meeting that were really tight with a dollar back then. So uh, <laughs> we can easily put that information together though. But I would say without, without question, the last three years have been in a very similar range. I think last year was 3.75 schools and 3.25 towns for a blended 3.5, if I remember correctly. It was a 50, 50 basis so spread. spray. Yeah. So was Mike, Mike, was your question on the um, levy increase? The last slide you said. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about the, the, the budget uh, increases, but obviously that translates to levy ultimately. Values are going to be checked because 2020 was the last the values were checked from 2020. Uh, they lag typically by a year, so January 1st is evaluation date for property taxes, and it's about uh, approximately a year behind a year the fiscal year. So you can't buy a house in Burlington these days for 600,000. <laughs> so we're not working on this January 1st, we're working on last January. Right. Uh, the residential numbers will typically be very solid because there are so many sales in town over the course of the year. Uh, but the taxes for the fiscal year 23 would be based upon values this past January 1st. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, may I, may I just add one thing? Uh, just to answer Mr. Hardy's question about the levy increase over the last five years, the average 4.8. I'm sorry, Mike, the, uh, the levy increase over the last five years averaged 4.8%, uh, of a high of 5.5 and a low of just under four. Okay. Hey, um, I should know, but I, I forget. Which contracts are up for renewal this coming year? Who is? Uh, all of them, all the towns. All of them, so we're, I thought there were some that weren't, but so everyone is, is some. Okay. They all expire on this coming June. On the school side, their teacher contract already expired coming into this year. Okay. So we owe money on that one. Which should be part of the negotiated settlement. Right. So we anticipated that. And, and then just another. We went from that. Just to say, yeah. Um, just to, for Gary, just uh, health, health costs, how, how are we trending this year? Again, that's from the accommodated account standpoint, that's generally one of the bigger uh, numbers and budgets that, that health, health care costs have uh, our claims have increased uh, but it's it's been a roller coaster one month there like last month the uh, Blue Cross was under what we estimated and health uh, uh, hard was was up it's I'd say there's a slight increase from what we originally expected in, in claims for this coming for this year yes. it's been a little difficult to track as, as everyone knows in 2020 nobody went to the hospital you know, right. people skipped a lot of appointments and, right. you know, there's been some makeup Smile. in the yeah. numbers for people catching up on things that they didn't, weren't able to get taken care of during the, um, you know, the darker days of the pandemic. So it's, it's a little bit less, uh, it's a little bit fluctuates a little bit more than it, it does for us historically at present. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brad and then uh, Frank. I, I so, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, to the administration. So I, uh, uh, Paul might have been uh, including uh, looking at uh, uh, Mike and uh, and me uh, about uh, uh, ways, former Ways and Means chairs who were tighter with a buck. Uh, we ran prop two and a half uh, uh, budgets, uh, uh, but that was uh, kind of enforced on us by the, uh, the crash of 2008. Things were uh, a little bit dicey at the time, but uh, I'm just curious. Uh, 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 our administrator has been involved in uh, the Burlington budget uh, for for uh, a, a bit longer even th th than I have. Um, 
Paul, what do you see the drivers uh, of the increase? Uh, that I was thinking OPEB is an additional expense, um, perhaps increased headcount, and certainly increased infrastructure spending. Or, or would you see those as the primary drivers on the increase? Uh, that's certainly part of it, you know, as well as, you know, collective bargaining, wage increases, of course, is the, you know, the biggest driver. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'd like to just drill in a little bit more on the accommodated account um, bucket. So, first of all, let's do, do the easy one. The, uh, the Middlesex retirement tariff that we're expecting, is that going to be typical or are there issues there? That's going to continue uh, probably at least for another 15, 20 years. But do you, you don't see any, do you know of any is this, big is, hikes coming? No, it, it is a graduated increase as we uh, move ahead, right. it's not going to be a, a large spike. And, and the earnings from that should be pretty decent, just like it is for OPEB, right? Yes. Yeah. In fact, it might be okay. So that's good. Yeah, but you have to look at what happened this past year. I think all all our investments did quite well. That's going to that's going to right. even we, back we gotta, up. Right. We got to go by the averages, and I right. think okay. So that's the retirement, um, and the, the similar comment would, would apply to OPEB. If we just follow the plan and don't do any accelerated money, it'll go up another 9%, and the earnings of, you know will probably stay close to the average that we expect. So that should just fall in line with an operating budget increase. And you had, what did you have for the accommodators? Five to seven? Yeah, 5.75 is yeah, so, what we're Yeah, for. so that sounds like it'd be okay. So the one that I'm <clears throat> I think I've gotten myself maybe confused on the principal and interest. So in the accommodated account, our, our debt principal and interest is built into that, and it's a number. And it was, a, I forget what it was last year, 7 million? It's 6.8. 6 6.8 million. And so just assuming that that takes the normal flow of going up some, does that have, what projects are not built into that that you think are coming up very quickly, if any? In particular, the PFAS, Bill Pond, and, and we're not going to roll in a school yet, right? So that wouldn't hit. That wouldn't hit maybe for two years. I mean, we have quite a bit of, of things that haven't hit yet. You know, public works uh, facility still under construction. Ah, I um, see. But so is that built into the, the rollout that you've got? It's built into the rollout. Everything's built into the rollout. Right. But in terms of the actual debt payment, there's no, there's, there's limited impact from it um, as we haven't borrowed all that. Start to, we start to amortize uh, next year from some of these loans that we took out this past year. Yeah. So Frank, on the, uh, just to add on, add to that on the on accommodated that the you know debt grows about ten percent, say the middle sex retirement grows at seven percent, and those are big numbers to begin with. OPEB grows ten percent, and then health insurance, which is the biggest number, uh, you know anywhere up to five percent. Uh, but it, uh, on the debt. The, the reason we do the smoothing effect is so that we don't get some of those dips and then have to increase the uh, appropriation the following year, which which you, you know well because we have right. to a lot of uh, a, a lot of detail. Yeah, yeah. So we we don't want a roller coaster coming out on the taxpayer. You don't want four percent one year and eight percent the next year, and right. So we you, you, you're doing it exactly the way it, it needs to be done. I'm certain of that. What I'm just trying to get a grip on is. I, mean, what, 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 I suspect we will vote in favor of what your recommendation is here. I certainly am going to. And the accommodated number looks, you know, not too bad. It looks like we should be able to get in that 5 to 7%. We roll that into the whole thing, and that's going to fit in in a 4 or 5% 5 levy. And, and, and the comment I'd make is even if, if valuations go up, the amount of money we need to raise is the amount of money we need to raise. It's not going to... It doesn't matter what happens to anything else. If you need that much money, you're going to set the tax rate to get that much money, and the real dollars that the taxpayer will pay aren't going to change. It's, that's what it's going to be, the 200 and, or the $6,000 tax bill or whatever the average one was. So by the, by the evaluations going up, the residential property values going up, it might indicate more capacity of the taxpayer to absorb it, but it's not going to change their bill. If they own more expensive homes, one would assume 
that they probably have better means. And so what we're trying to do is not cripple the people that are in fixed incomes and still sitting in the houses that they want to keep for the next 10 years, no matter what the valuation is. They got to live here. And so I think this plan does that. I think it's a good balance. Um, at some point, we have to build this infrastructure that we're talking about. I, I don't think there's any way around it. You can drive the town into the ground if you, mm -hmm. if you can delay things longer than you should. You actually can. And the net result of that on the real long run, the 10 to 15 year long run, is that you've got the lapidation on your hands in certain places. And that's, that's never good. That always catches up with you. And the last thing, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, Mr. Chairman. Just one last thing, this whole PFAS thing, is this all, is this all premised on we, we're not going to close Bill Pond, ever? Correct. Uh, in order to maintain the redundancy of the water system, the decision right. was made to maintain Mill Pond. We're still actually paying for that renovation right. as well. So we need to pay what we're having done. I, I personally think we need to, we should revisit, um, even in a five-year window, whether we should continue to um, run Mill Pond. Mr. Chairman, pa Paul's point, I agree with you, disagree in the beginning, agree with you in the middle, and disagree with you in the end. Paul's <laughs> point about the aqueduct, the aqueduct failed from clogging. What would we do if we didn't have a redundant system? I don't want to run us down a rat hole. I, 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 would just say, I think that is the yeah, last I mean, worry I've got on the planet. It did two uh, years ago. How many years ago did the aqueduct fail? Probably about six years ago. But right, I guess so. the more important point is we're getting ready, ready to invest $15 million in the Mill Pond plant to solve the PFAS problem. So um, I'm not sure if we want to make that investment and walk away from the plant anytime. <laughs> right. Well, right. Right. well, well that will come up again if we have mm -hmm. another problem. But that's in the schedule that's there now. Now we'll turn to John Soapbox. <laughs> I'll can't, complain can't about Frank talking too long. So, uh, <laughs> let me see what time it is. <laughs> uh, it, there, uh, there is one potential consequence uh, with the property values that I'm curious about. The uh, if, And it seems like this might be the case, that the residential property values could be going up faster than the commercial ones. And if we're bumping up against the maximum CIP shift, that could be an issue. Are we anywhere near that maximum allowed or? Uh, we're not. Oh. Uh, we shift at approximately one, 163, max is 175. Okay, so That's a conscious decision. We've got margin. Uh, generally and historically, if the property values move generally in the same direction, uh, they, the shift typically works well. Um, it really becomes a problem when they're moving in opposite directions in a, in a big way. And it, that was the old. Uh, issue in 2004-2005. Okay. Uh, and then the, the other question uh, had to do with the gentleman who spoke at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and when I look at the numbers, it, it seems that, you know, basically our head count across both town and school is fairly constant. And our wage expense is going up about 5% every year, including last year. Uh, so I'm a little confused what he was talking about in terms of employee concessions being made last year. It, am I missing something there? It seems like there were no concessions because the increase was fairly consistent with what we've been seeing and higher than inflation. And that was a personnel matter, so. <laughs> I see. Okay. I was going to clarify that offline. All right. Very good. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something fundamental there. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Right. Chairman, honest, I'll be really, really short. Our whole <laughs> budget is, is what, 80% labor? 85? 85. 85. All right. So, that. you know, when you take labor with COLA plus benefits, you're going to see increases like this just by waking up in the morning. So what you got to do is have enough extra in there that you can manage good investments in infrastructure at a steady pace to keep progressing the town forward. That's the balance we're trying to hit. The only wrinkle in this whole thing is that the commercial, the the offsets from uh, hotels, for example, hurt, it's worried us quite a bit. And we also worry quite a bit about the shift in the mix of the real estate, that some of it would just go away. Hence, you keep you want to keep building office and and labs and, and you know repurpose all this stuff, which we're doing aggressively. And I think in the end, and we'll know in five years, but you know with a little bit of luck and smart planning on the business side, we should be just as healthy as we ever were. But that's what we gotta watch. 
The only fly in the ointment is a recession, and when did we have one last? Jerry. I can't remember. If, if I may, exactly. Mr. Chair, but thank you. The, uh, the values of the commercial, obviously, this past year were not what we have seen in prior years. Some of the segments increased, uh, some not. I think the uh, benefits of having the economic uh, development uh, office or department have uh, bearing some fruit uh, now. And, and the increase in values were in the life services, not necessarily, and maybe the decrease in the hospitality and the retail. So I think the planning from the community has, is, has proven to be successful as we move ahead. It's are the values going to you know, continue to go as interest rates increase? Will we see some uh, leveling off or uh, uh, maybe even a slight decrease? I don't know. I, I tend to be very conservative about that. The growth in this past year was basically on the uh, on the residential side and not on the commercial. So. Seeing no question. Question accept the recommendation. Thanks, Phil. Second. Who is the second? Thank you. Mike Hardy. Yes. Brad Bond. Yes. Chris Campbell. Uh, Roger Riggs? Yes. Ed Parsons? Yes. Frank Monaco? Yes. Bill Gallagher? Yes. David T? Yes. Rob Newfeld? Yes. John Eiler? Yes. Bob Davidson? Yes. And Chair votes aye. That's 12 0. So that bring, concludes tonight's agenda. So I think Thanks. in. Oh, minutes? minutes. Yeah, of course. Forget Thanks. minutes. So just yeah, thank you. before we get to minutes, just a little bit with schedule. Um, budget season is fast approaching. I think our next meeting will probably be the last Wednesday of the month. Uh, and that's when we'll get the budget overview. And uh, at that point in time, I'll have a full schedule of what will uh, be in front of us for the rest of the year. Now that we have the guidelines, the subcommittees can go ahead and meet with the departments. Well, no, next comes the, so the budgets were due to the town around, I think, January 31st. Yeah, so, they go through the so they have to go through the meetings and adjustments. The and then, yeah, so they'll, they'll bring those budgets to us. The budget overview meeting will be in our next meeting. That'll be probably about an hour meeting. And then after that, um, the, I'll have a full schedule and then the subcommittees can uh, meet with the departments. There have been no changes uh, to the subcommittees except the, the two new uh, new hires, if you will, um, are with the school subcommittee. So, um, Brad, if you need help with Town Hall 2, uh, John and I will be happy to, to help you with those. Um, and Great. you've got your hands up. Yeah, uh, and Steve, uh, uh, does uh, the Selections Office want our old budget books, or do they not want us to bother bringing them in? Um, I didn't specifically ask, but I'm pretty sure they will take them. If Whitney's still paying attention to us, she might. Yes, yes, help. please bring them back. That's All right. very helpful. <laughs> That's the helpful. They, they, they will see back. Yes. And um, if you have a preference for the budget books or the online or, or both, send me an email and I'll tab uh, tabulate them and give them to Whitney. Well, the online's always there, right? right. The online is always there. Yes, and Whitney will give us a demonstration at some point as to probably at the next meeting at this John point. John will do that. What's that? John will do that. <laughs> John will do that, yes. He'll give you all the tips of using Adobe PDF to read through them. So minutes, so there's the September meeting and then uh, the January meeting. So let's start with the September meeting. Motion to approve. Thank you, John. <laughs> Second. Thank you, Doug. Um, Mike Hardy. Yes. Brad Bond. Uh, yes. Chris Campbell. Yes. Uh, were you at the September meeting, it? right? It's abstaining, isn't it? Yeah. Were you, I'm sorry. So um, were you at the September meeting? So you'll, you'll abstain. And I think Ed's in the same boat, is that right? Correct. Okay. okay. Roger Riggs? Aye. Aye. Is that a yes? Aye, yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, 
Thanks. <laughs> Frank? Yes. Phil? Yes. Uh, David? Yes. Uh, Roger? I'm uh, sorry, Rob? Yes. John Eiler? Yes. Doug? Yes. And the chair votes aye. So then the, um, the January meeting. And John, you had some corrections. Did you want to mention? Um, if I can remember. I, I, I have the email so I can bring it up. It's so long. <laughs> oh, I, I think it was uh, just Doug was oh. there for the beginning of the meeting. So just, that was just, yeah, and then technical you stepped out. Yeah, oh, okay. And I think there was a typo or something. That's yeah. Okay. All right. So chair will entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. No, oh, not that no. one. Oh, <laughs> motion. Minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Good try, Frank. Yeah, we got past that. <laughs> and I hear a second. You can sneak out if you want. I'll, I'll call you first so you can go, Frank. I wanted to congratulate yes. Brad and. Uh, and uh, Roger for not showing umbrage over being called by cheap uh, called cheapskates by Denise. Phil. <laughs> 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 yes. David. Yes. Rob. Yes. Yes. Doug. Abstain. Abstain. Do you remember me, Phil? <laughs> oh Mike. yeah, Michael. Sorry. <laughs> Mike. Uh, yes. Chris. Did I miss someone? Brad, I missed Brad. Uh, I missed the quarter of a minute. Oh, awesome. That's going to be all night. <laughs> Frank, you had a motion. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Frank. Yeah. That's debatable. Yeah. Roger, do you have something? Uh, no, I was seconding the motion. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, great. Well said. Well said. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Thanks Steve.